Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. Honduras says it's switching recognition from Taiwan to China, which would leave Taiwan with 13 allies. It comes ahead of President Tsai Ing-wen's trip to Central America in April. This and much more in today's show. I'm joined today in our new studios by Alexander Huang, Guomingdang or KMT International Affairs Director and representative to the U.S. Former Taiwan Mainland Affairs Deputy Minister and Tamkang University International Affairs Associate Professor. Wen Ti Sung, also Australian National University's Australian Centre on China in the World Lecturer and an expert in Taiwan-US-China affairs. Alexander Wen Ti, thank you so much for joining the show today. Honduras and Taiwan's ties have lasted more than 80 years since 1941. But if the Central American country goes through with its decision to recognize Beijing, that relationship will end. China does not allow countries to hold diplomatic relations with both itself and Taiwan. Let's take a look at Taiwan's 13 remaining allies. We have Iswatini, the Vatican, Belize, Guatemala, Haiti, Paraguay, in also the Marshall Islands, Nauru, Palau, and Tuvalu. This report by Bing Wang and Leon Lian. On Wednesday morning, March 15th, Honduras President Shiromaru Castro posted on Twitter that she would officially open relations with China. This means that Honduras would break off its diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Both Beijing and Taipei have claimed to represent all of China, and to this day neither allows for international recognition of the other. This comes 14 months after Castro was sworn in as the leader of Honduras. Taiwan has 14 diplomatic allies, including Honduras. During her campaign, Shiromaru Castro said that she would break out ties with Taiwan in favor of China. She later backtracked on that position. This is the first time Shiromaru Castro has made an announcement about Taiwan since taking office. Honduras and Taiwan have shared diplomatic relations since 1941. Should the diplomatic rupture go through, Honduras will become the second country to break relations with Taiwan since President Tsai Ing-wen began her second term in 2020, but the ninth since she took office in 2016. Nicaragua is the latest country to sever ties with Taiwan, which happened in December of 2021. The announcement will leave Taiwan with just 13 formal diplomatic allies. The majority of those are Honduras neighbors in Central America and the Caribbean. Hondurans in Taiwan are worried about how this will affect their status. It is very unexpected to them, and like uh, I can see that some of them are really nervous, uh, you know, a little, a little afraid, you know, of, of like uh, maybe having to 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 leave Taiwan, and uh, many of them are asking the asking me the question like, uh, how can what can they do to stay, uh, even if the relationship breaks, like if there any possibility that they are able to stay in Taiwan because uh, they don't seem too willing to go to China. Taiwan Plus reached out to the Honduran embassy in Taiwan, but they said they had no comment on the matter. The foreign ministry summoned the Honduran ambassador and warned that Honduras should not fall into China's trap. There's also concern that Paraguay, Taiwan's last remaining ally in South America, may also break diplomatic relations after its general election next month. The loss of another ally will sting Taipei, but the country has developed friendly informal relations with democracies around the world and authorities here say they will continue to develop these unofficial ties. Lian Lian, Sally Jensen, and Bing Wang for Taiwan Plus. China's poaching of Taiwan's allies is not only part of Beijing's plan to isolate the island nation, but to reduce its very recognition as a country under international law. Jacques Delille, an expert in China and international law, and University of Pennsylvania's Stephen A. Cousin, professor of law and foreign policy research institute Asia director, explains why. 
Taiwan has a good case for satisfying the criteria for statehood for being a country under international law. The, the classic standards are that there be a distinct population, a distinct territory, uh, that, that within that territory and among those people, it's self-governing in the sense of not being uh, a component government in a larger state. Uh, and that it has the capacity to engage in international relations. That last prong is sort of the stickiest because, of course, Taiwan has relatively limited formal diplomatic ties with the governments of other states, but it has a very robust international presence. It's uh, got informal representation in many countries around the world. It's the member, it's a member of many important international organizations, and it has a degree of participation. Uh, in others. And you talked about the um, diplomatic um, allies. So th this would explain why China obviously has been trying to poach those um, allies from Taiwan. Yes, that's right. And we've seen a gradual erosion of the number of states that maintain formal diplomatic ties with the Republic of China versus the People's Republic. That's been uh, shifting steadily since the 1970s. And uh, since 2016, China has resumed poaching those diplomatic allies so that uh, Taiwan is now down to the very low double digits. But uh, the, the, it's not at all clear that you need formal diplomatic rec recognition to meet the criterion of engaging in international relations. There's a quite strong argument that informal participation will do. Uh, and I think Beijing runs a risk if it poaches the rest of Taiwan's diplomatic allies. It could do one of two things, either back Taiwan enough into a corner that it takes more provocative in Beijing's eyes steps to safeguard its security, or that Taiwan just code switches and say, we're not going to make the argument about formal diplomatic relations anymore. We're going to insist instead on the robust informal international presence that Taiwan enjoys, and indeed has uh, enjoyed something of an uptick in, in the last several years as China has increased pressure on Taiwan and the U.S. and others have pushed back. That was Jacques Delisle of the University of Pennsylvania speaking with me earlier. Alexander, if I can ask you the first question. So the Honduran foreign minister has come out and said the decision was based on pragmatism and not on ideology. Now, Taiwan has said, you know, not to drink poison and fall into a trap. Uh, what impact will this have on Honduras? What will it gain? What will it lose? I think the uh, Honduran uh, case is not unique because there, we have experienced several uh, uh, countries that uh, de-recognized uh, the Republic of China and switched their diplomatic recognition to Beijing. Uh, with similar reasons. Uh, it could be seen as realism, it could be understandable for practical concern, but uh, in a sense, uh, we still need to put it in the timeline. You know, Honduras uh, and, uh, and the Republic of China have maintained 82 years of diplomatic relationship. Uh, we had done a lot for our friends in, in Honduras, and, um, and uh, also the United States had helped us in recent years to secure such a diplomatic uh, relationship. Uh, the Honduran move uh, was not fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had intels, information, um, you know, there were discussions for years. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is really unfortunate mm -hmm. that, that they uh, finally decided that even though we have made extra effort mm. uh, to uh, maintain such a relationship, uh, to make Taiwan a formal diplomatic relationship under international law mm. as a, a sovereign country. Um, and, uh, but but this, is, uh, this is a time uh, that, uh, that we all that need to be uh, very careful and uh, inform for the last minute effort mm. to inform our friends in Honduras that a short term gain and a long term benefit might not be the same. Mm. And uh, we will do our part. Wanti, will Honduras, um, as, as Alexander that said there, it will get infrastructure. It's getting a hydroelectric dam, we understand, uh, being built and financed by China. But will it also get saddled in ever more debt? I mean, it has. The reports say between eight and twenty billion dollars of debt. Yeah, I mean that's a, always going to be a potential risk for Honduras as well as for a number of developing countries around the world who are interested in securing uh, less traditional sources of financing. Let's put it that way. 
and uh, and I think obviously there is an expectation that with uh, political gestures such as switching recognition from ROC to uh, Beijing, a number of countries would believe that that political gesture alone will be sufficient to win them, uh, be it loans, be it aids on advantageous terms. But these things all have to ultimately be a payback to some degree at some level uh, because at some point Beijing will have to find a way to not only justify it to their own people but also to keep their own state own finance sector afloat as well. Mm. So in that sense, while there may be shorter term immediate uh, windfall potentially economically from participation in China's financing uh, schemes uh, through a move like this, uh, that does not automatically eliminate all a longer term financial and economic risk down the road for countries like Honduras, which mm. is why it may be relatively easy money for the short term, but they should always, again, keep a longer term calculus in mind mm. as well. Yes, what Alexander also said. Now, the decision actually comes before Tsai Ing-wen, our president's trip to Central America in April, Alexander, uh, to Guatemala and Belize, mm -hmm. um, and also transiting through the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, tell us about Taiwan now. Is this a blow to Taiwan? And maybe you could think about it diplomatically, economically, militarily. Since the news came out, uh, we have some local polls, uh, and uh, the majority of the people re uh, responded pretty calm. Uh, I would say it's accounted for nearly 60 percent of the people that do not believe that we will be severely hurt. Mm. Of course, um, maybe hurt by heart, but, uh, but uh, our interests uh, or critical uh, interests will not be hurt by this move uh, on the account of Honduras. I think uh, people may easily to think that uh, this move uh, can be interpreted that connecting to uh, President Tsai Ing-wen's uh, upcoming trip uh, in late March uh, to Belize and uh, Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but. Uh, but we also understand that uh, about a week ago there was another news leak and, and suggesting that Taiwan was trying to make uh, a, a South Pacific island state uh, to switch their recognition from Beijing to Taipei. Ah, Micronesia? Uh, that's Micronesia. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so, so it's a kind of tug of war mm. for decades that between Beijing and Taipei. Mm. And uh, there will be some point. Mm. that we need to face the reality. Mm. The real challenge is that how Taiwan collectively, um, both government and the opposition, think about our official diplomatic relations mm. and the numbers of countries given us that recognition and what would that mean in our future engagement mm. in, and participation in the international organization. So, so what do you mean by face, face the issue, fa face reality? is that uh, we, we need to uh, probably, again, take in this opportunity to review our narratives and our standing mm -hmm. and, and see whether we will, uh, you know, spend significant national resources to maintain such a uh, diplomatic relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not speaking very diplomatically mm -hmm. because uh, we That's have okay. an international <laughs> audience uh, so, so you're saying, uh, so this kind of dollar diplomacy in order right, to keep uh, our allies, you believe maybe we should reassess whether it's financially was worth it? Yeah, again, it. If, if, mm. if, if Honduran mm. government uh, is bargaining and negotiating mm. with my country and asking for the money that, uh, that way beyond what a normal uh, overseas uh, direct investment should be, mm. And, uh, and what I can pay would, back. I, yeah, yeah, and their ability to return mm. to pay back. And also, I would also think that whether, uh, you know, we gave enough support to Ukraine, mm. you know, in, in dollar sense. So this is a very complicated issue. I, I, think, I think we should uh, really sit back and think hard about this uh, practice. Mm. Wanti, some, some thoughts there from Alexander. Um, can we talk about, it's still in the diplomatic space that um, Alexander was talking about. Um, a little bit, let's reflect on what Jacques Delisle was saying in terms of you know, this recognition 
internationally and what China is attempting to do? Uh, I think if Taiwan was going to pursue uh, continue official diplomatic allies uh, on a dollar diplomacy basis versus Beijing, then uh, with, a, with Beijing being somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 times Taiwan's population, at some point trying to match Beijing dollar for dollar is not going to be in Taiwan's best interest. So, and that's also in addition to another factor, and that is just like the case in Honduras, for example, each time a friendly country has a new change of government, there always comes a risk of a new, a new ruling party trying to bring in new ideas, mm. perhaps new approaches to recruit finances. I'd yeah, say. because that was actually a campaign promise of Xiomara Castro. Mm -hmm. yeah. Indeed. So in this way, you can always say that that's really a still new leadership trying to be accountable to their own people mm. <laughs> to deliver on uh, what they promised. Uh, which is why I think Taiwan should be, rather than trying to spend all its resources on maintaining official relations with so many countries, what it should be doing is to play a long game. And that is to both uh, focus resources on building long-standing society-to-society relations, regardless of well, whether you have official relations or not. Mm -hmm. That will ultimately uh, cultivate more friendly audience uh, in mm -hmm. foreign countries, for, if you will, which mm -hmm. will be perhaps a more longer staying power hmm. kind of constitution, constituency that will work for you. So maybe based on, d on democracy, like-minded uh, ideals and values. That Certainly sort of like-minded yeah. value alignment, but also hmm. in terms of economic and technological assistance project. Hmm. These are kind of things that build friendship across hmm. societies, hmm. not just between governments. But, but that would be the, the basic fundamentals is that it's democracy to democracy. Or not necessarily? <laughs> On that, <laughs> I, I think that's going to be any Taiwan ruling party's uh, <laughs> <laughs> approach. But I'll say mm -hmm. that um, just like Biden administration, so-called Summit for Democracy, uh, a year or so ago, you it used to invite democracy mm -hmm. as well as democracy with asterisks mm -hmm. or guided democracies. Mm -hmm. Democracy can come in many forms. So value alignment is definitely a key ingredient but that doesn't have to be the only ingredient. Mm. Alexander, so we spoke about Castro's election pledge, mm -hmm. but then shortly after she was inaugurated, she then said she wanted to continue ties with Taiwan. Now, of course, US, the US was um, you know, a factor in her announcement. Um, the fact that now, however, uh, Honduras will switch recognition, or intends to, says it will, is this a sign of declining US influence in this region? A, a short answer, I would probably have to say yes, uh, that uh, the, um, the United States approach to uh, Latin America uh, was in different forms. And, and, uh, and uh, for the case of Honduras, uh, we, we must know that, uh, that Honduras is a, a rather unique uh, for the United States in Central Asia because, because uh, there is a Soto uh, Gano uh, Air Base that, that hosts house more than uh, 1,200 uh, 1, uh, American troops there. So it has been a long-standing air base that American operated. And, and also it's the base for uh, the Joint Task Force Bravo. Um, so Honduras itself, it's, it's very firm compared to other Latin Central American states they're closer uh, to the United States, or the United States has more leverage over Honduras. Probably that's why that uh, Silmara Castro uh, changed her mind after inaugural. But this time, uh, we see that she changed that again. Um, and uh, probably the United States had already helped us and tried very hard uh, mm -hmm. to secure the uh, recognition. But uh, apparently that, that President Castro wanted to uh, go her own way. Uh, and, and so uh, we will have to see that how American Congress would react, mm -hmm. you know, because the United States did have a legislation that would... The Taipei Act. The mm -hmm. Taipei Act mm -hmm. uh, to punish uh, the, uh, the Taiwan's diplomatic allies to switch mm -hmm. their recognition. Uh, I don't know how the United States would do that, uh, how hard uh, would it hurt American interests itself. Mm. So, but, but I think we, we need to uh, talk to both Washington 
And, uh, and uh, probably we need to do a last minute effort in Tegucigalpa mm -hmm. and see if we can, um, you know, at least we work very hard uh, to maintain such a relationship. Mm. Monty, would you, how far do you think the U.S. will go? And Alexander mentioned about harming, perhaps it could harm U.S. interests in, depending on how hard um, they push in terms of, you know, I guess the, the punishment um, for switching to China. Um, you know, is this a blow, not just, um, when we talked about be, it maybe being a blow to Taiwan, but is it more of a blow to, to the U.S.? Uh, potentially, yes. I think U.S. is in the era where the era of U.S. hegemony may be gradually on the wane, even though the era of U.S. unipolarity is still here to stay. Uh, in more concrete terms, that just means that U.S. still is the single most important actor, but U.S. alone cannot be the one-stop shop that solves all your problems. And certainly from Taiwan's perspective, while it is always helpful to have U.S., a strong relation with U.S., as your important avenue for which to solve many problems, uh, ta Taiwan cannot and should not expect U.S. to incur great cost to itself in matters such as this, uh, just for Taiwan to maintain one more uh, so-called diplomatic ally on the books. And that is why I think there's always going to be a balancing act that Taiwan needs to strike in terms of holding on firmly to its values and principles, but also being an understanding ally and partner at the same time as well. And this is going to be a challenge, I think, for policymakers in both countries. Thank you. So while Beijing continues its diplomatic isolation campaign, there are other elements of its plan to unify with Taiwan. These include spreading propaganda and using cognitive warfare to change Taiwanese views about becoming part of China. To discuss whether the CCP is succeeding, I speak with Miao Boya, Taipei City Councillor, ruling Social Democratic Party spokesperson and Taiwan Alliance to end the death penalty legal director. Let's take a look. I think that most uh, important change is that uh, Taiwanese identity has been dramatically changed. And there are only less than 5% of Taiwanese people identify themselves as Chinese. So I think in the, you know, in, in the different generation or the, uh, the most important change in young generation is that we have much more stronger self-identity and uh, we recognize ourselves as an independent country. So as Taiwan has built that identity, China has needed to crack down more. I know that um, China and Taiwan, has an, we, we don't have language barrier. We use uh, Mandarin as our main language, and we, we also use uh, you know, the, the same similar character because as uh, many people know China has uh, sponsored many uh, newspapers or uh, televisions news televisions in Taiwan so they're very easy to spread some disinformation and also they're trying to use social media it is very normal for people living in uh, democracy to criticize government. So um, it's, it's very easy for China to use some uh, highway welfare tactic to interfere in Taiwan's normal democratic discussion. But when it comes to some national security issue or some foreign policy issue, it's not so easy for China to interfere. We know that very crystal clear that um, we are a democracy. The Taiwanese identity is built on a democratic system. In Chinese propaganda, they will say that we have the same blood. I think the most uh, distinguished part is that we have a total different system. So uh, for the Taiwanese, um, I think there are only less than 2%, maybe 2% Taiwanese wants to uh, reunify with China because we don't like their system. It's very natural for Taiwanese to say that we are two different countries because we have a total different system. When you look at the Ukrainian and their family or language um, links, some of them, not all, uh, with Russia, do you see similarities um, between, well, with 
Taiwan and China. I think that uh, maybe uh, the dictators are very similar, like uh, Hitler or Nazi also use some uh, the similar propaganda because um, they in their propaganda they describe a, a great alien nation. And so also the Russian describe a, a great Slavia nation and they claim that Ukraine doesn't exist in history and Ukraine is an undetachable part of um, Russian empire. And if you look at the CCP, the Chinese government's propaganda, you can see very, very similar narrative. China will say that Taiwanese are also Chinese, and they are trying to use the idea that we have the, uh, in, in Mandarin, it's like uh, we have the same language, and we are the same race, and uh, uh, Tong Zhong, or they will use another, another propaganda as that the, uh, uh, we have the same blood, uh, they would say Xianong Yu Sui, and trying to create a false ideology about um, if we are we have the same blood, we should be a same nation. And it's quite useful uh, in uh, decades before, but it's not useful right now because right now uh, the Taiwanese identify ourselves as Taiwanese is not because our race. Is because our system. So um, uh, we support uh, the democratic system. That was Councillor Mao Boya speaking to me earlier. One of Beijing's main target groups for its influence campaigns is ex-generals. 500 of them have been invited to an anniversary at a Chinese military academy. Eric Gao, Eason Chen and Sam Hui to report. Don't go to China. That's the message from Taiwan's Veteran Affairs Ministry to retired soldiers. It comes as reports surface online that China wants 500 Taiwanese veterans to attend events marking the 99th anniversary of a military academy. Beijing claims Taiwan as its own, and officials here say this invitation is part of United Front unification tactics. The Huangpu Military Academy is marking its 99th anniversary in June. It was founded in 1924 under the leadership of Republic of China founder Sun Yat-sen. After the Chinese Civil War, the nationalist government relocated the academy to Kaohsiung in southern Taiwan. Since then, the original has only been used as a propaganda tool by the Chinese Communist Party. While officials are urging veterans not to go, the government has no way to enforce this as a rule, and therefore isn't technically able to do anything to stop them. This online recruitment drive for Taiwan's veterans supposedly closes at the end of March. The government here is looking into who is behind the plan and who's funding it. Meanwhile, Taiwan is planning its own commemorative events for Huangpu Academy, which will celebrate its 100th anniversary next year. Eason Chen, Sam Hui, and Eric Gao for Taiwan Plus. Alexander, why is Taiwan worried about hundreds of um, veterans going to China for this military academy anniversary? I think we should put this uh, specific proposal or idea uh, into a timeline. Um, we all know that uh, China has uh, completed its 20th Party's Congress in October last year and uh, the Liang Huoyi or two sessions uh, earlier this month. So, so in a post-COVID, uh, three years of isolation for everyone, um, China has said that 2023 will be uh, the grand opening uh, that re-engage uh, and open to the outside world for travelers and others. So that, that's one account. The other one is that um, China, at least uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping had sound that he intended to uh, so-called reunify 
China through peaceful means, um, uh, and at least for the time being. So, of course, uh, under such a guide, guideline, uh, you know, uh, the agent, government agencies and the provincial workers, they will try to fulfill the work that they are supposed to do and by inviting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan, not only veterans, but also, uh, you know, local uh, government uh, counselors uh, and uh, farmers and others mm -hmm. to visit uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is to persuade them the, the, to, uni uh, to, to go along with unification? Uh, of course, they intended to do mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, but whether they can do their job, that's mm -hmm. another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mm -hmm. always have, a, a, you know, a very strong trust about uh, the, the vibrant democracy mm -hmm. uh, and people's free mindset mm -hmm. in Taiwan. And mm -hmm. I don't think that, that uh, you know, even the government cannot brainwash the people how <laughs> can our enemy, you know, uh, and adversary to brainwash our people. I think it also highlights uh, that uh, we need to put into concern whether these kind of um, thing, if it takes place, whether it will send a uh, mixed signals to mm. the international community. Right. Because most of the uh, outside observers would have a easy logic, you mm. know, black and white, right and wrong, you know, against China or pro-China. Mm. So, so when you engage, uh, then people would think, you know, you are falling into a trap mm. uh, that mm -hmm. the communist China set for you. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, because, but because the two military, this is a military that, that uh, people in will a few years compare time. the military <laughs> confrontation uh, yeah. near the median mm -hmm. line and this kind of visit. Mm -hmm. But there are much deeper uh, uh, and social factors that involve in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I understand why there are people would love to go but I don't think you know we have 500 mm. uh, that's their intention so mm. we need to be very aware of mm. you know how China would do their propaganda to exaggerate uh, what they are doing mm. and the actual how how Taiwan or how veteran groups would res respond to mm. that. Wunti, can you talk to that Alexander said you know the optics don't look good however there are actually you know, deep links um, between between Taiwan and China. What do you believe that uh, the concerns, are they merely optics or does this go much deeper? I mean, obviously ex-veterans, you know, they have networks, they know current serving members too. Um, maybe they have intelligence, you know, from their days. Hmm. This is all pretty dangerous or not? It's, uh, hmm. well, this kind of reminds me of big debate about globalization from back in my early days, really in undergrad, but uh, about whether exchange or interaction itself is necessarily good or bad uh, or not. Uh, I think these days, uh, the optics here, I think the usual concern people have is that when uh, Taiwanese generals retire or current, uh, in this case mostly retired, uh, go to participate in events uh, in the PRC, they are likely to be subject to or be vulnerable to some kind of influence operation, perhaps propaganda, perhaps some other ways of United Front work being applied onto them. And therefore, <coughs> since they all have uh, either subordinates or colleagues still serving in Taiwan's military or security apparatus, that could potentially be a security risk. I think that is the general, uh, general concern uh, in, in a very broad brush terms. However, I think Interaction itself doesn't necessarily always have to be bad. Uh, just like such exchange could be one way for them to influence retired Taiwanese generals, why can't this be Taiwanese retired generals way to influence back, for example? I think that's one thing. And also, uh, we see this a lot going on between US and China at various points in the past as well. Less clear over the last few years, but uh, definitely in the past, you have retired general from US and China hang out in Sanya, for example, other places exactly. around China or in Asia and elsewhere, where they have unofficial track to, track to dialogue mechanism happening, which may also play a useful positive role in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, for our era, when official to official communication links seem to be uh, rather struggling. Mm -hmm. So a lot still depends, and I think um, we don't necessarily have to rush to judgment, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but what is important is that this process be handled with transparency, both from the participants and from Taiwanese government uh, as well, about mm -hmm. how what's going to be intent itinerary of these kind of exchanges. Mm -hmm. Alexander, one last question before we wrap this mm -hmm. section up. Um, you know, the, the military has been um, in the media um, quite a lot, you know, and there have been uh, doubts or people have posited perhaps doubts about the military's loyalty. For our international audience, can you tell us why? Because th this, to an international audience, this would sound You know, I, I'm not a strange. spokesperson for uh, the uniform service, uh, but I grew up from a military family. I, I hate to see people question about loyalty issue. Mm. You know, if we see Taiwan as a vibrant, uh, you know, full-fledged democracy, then you can tell that with several change of government in the past 20 plus years, that our military had been a very, very stabilizing force mm. and, and a very apolitical. Mm. What we need to take care of is that whether we see those veteran groups being alienated by the society, or whether their heritage uh, being uh, you know, honored, mm. you know, whether their benefit uh, uh, or their tradition that being uh, you know, put in the high place by the government. So I believe that, um, that we need to do better job to make sure, you know, when people are focusing on whether veteran groups are, might, doing, might do harm to our national interest, but, but on the other hand, if we can carefully manage with more conversation with them and uh, honoring their tradition and heritage, I think we can build a better civil military relationship mm. for the future generations. Mm. So, so on one hand, it might be an episode uh, of worry, but uh, on the other hand, it is a great chance to make things right. Mm. Okay, I, I appreciate your you know, defense of, of the military, that side of the argument, but just for our international audience, Wanti, can you address why is it that perhaps they're perceived to be lower hanging fruit for Beijing? Is because of uh, the history of before uh, the KMT came to Taiwan in 1949? Uh, to a significant extent, yes. Uh, we know that Huangpu Military School, uh, which is a military academy going back for almost a century, of course, uh, back in Guangdong province, uh, that's a military academy that trained very top level leaders in the military in both Taiwan and the PRC today. And so, um, well, today and the offspring and the student and so forth. And so there is a common link there that they try to leverage through this broadly defined alumni network. It's sort of an easier, less superficially political way for people to uh, hang out together and to, to discuss topics that may be purely intellectual or maybe somewhat politically adjacent given the nature of their common uh, almometer, for example. So I think that's one major reason why this seems to be an important vehicle for which such interaction can take place and can find justification in both societies uh, until relatively recently, that is. Okay, thank you. Now, one of the West's countermeasures against China's military assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region is AUKUS. AUKUS is a trilateral security partnership between Australia, the UK and the US. Under the deal, Australia will purchase nuclear-powered submarines. Stash Butler and Klein Wang report. Sunny skies in San Diego as the US, the UK and Australia announce a milestone deal to give nuclear submarines to the land down under for the very first time. Simply stated, we're putting ourselves in the strongest possible position to navigate the challenges of today and tomorrow, together. So what did they agree to? Under the New Deal, Australia will begin sending military and civilian personnel to the UK and the US this year to learn how to operate nuclear submarines. At the beginning of the 2030s, the US plans to sell Australia three to five of its existing Virginia-class submarines. And then, towards the end of the decade, the UK will finish building its first new AUKUS nuclear submarines, and Australia will do the same a few years later. All that will cost Australia about 200 billion US dollars over three decades. The AUKUS agreement we confirm here in San Diego 
represents the biggest single investment in Australia's defence capability in all of our history. The nuclear submarines Australia will get run off nuclear reactors, but they don't carry nuclear weapons. They don't need to come up for air so often, so they're stealthier than conventional subs, and they can travel much farther. To the head of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, the aim of the deal is clear. So obviously this is about eroding Chinese um, claims to the region, which many, uh, like the United States, like uh, Australia, see as, um, as, as illegitimate. Experts see AUKUS as a way of countering what the US and its allies see as belligerence from China. Beijing has been more and more willing to back its claims over the South China Sea with military force and its ramped up activity around Taiwan, which it considers part of its territory. To the AUKUS leaders, that's part of a wider pattern. Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, China's growing assertiveness, the destabilizing behavior of Iran and North Korea, all threaten to create a world defined by danger, disorder and division. But China says the deal will only mean more instability. Taiwan welcomed AUKUS when it was formed a year and a half ago as a way of keeping peace in the region. But foreign policy expert Bryce Wakefield sees it two ways. One could argue that it actually helps to deter a Chinese um, uh, Chinese invasion on Taiwan. On the flip side, one could argue that it's quite a provocative uh, strategy and will be seen as such in Beijing. Practical questions remain, things like whether Australia can build the expertise needed to operate the new subs and how it will pay for them. But to the leaders in San Diego, the goal of keeping peace in the Indo-Pacific more than justifies its cost and the long decades needed to achieve it. Klein Wang and Stash Butler for Taiwan Plus. Alexander, China has reacted badly to this AUKUS deal. What does it mean, practically speaking, the, the um, nuclear-powered submarines? We've got a CG. So there you can see, you know, hypothetically, a submarine could travel, a nuclear submarine, because it can travel, you know, faster and farther, and it can be stealthier because it doesn't need to come up to the surface to refuel. If we could have the, the, um, the graphic again. Could travel uh, to, from, from Australia to Taiwan much more effectively than a traditional right, right, diesel right. submarine. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. given the features of a nuclear power submarine, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, will have a larger AOR area of responsibility, mm -hmm. which means that, that the submarine can be deployed in the larger you know, mm -hmm. uh, area in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And also it's, it's more quiet, mm -hmm. uh, it's more stealthy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, that could uh, not be easily found. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, it's very large operating area and uh, stealthiness would serve as a deterrent mm -hmm. because you make your adversary to, to guess that mm -hmm. where are you mm -hmm. and, and what would you do? Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Number two is that the nuclear power submarine, usually uh, during the Cold Wars as we understood, should be a strategic platform. Mm. Uh, it carries uh, nuclear warheads. Mm. But for AUKUS, uh, Australian uh, submarine, the United States has stated that mm. it would be nuclear powered but, not, but, but without nuclear weapon on mm. board. Um, you know, that's also, this kind of ambiguous description mm. would also make your adversary to guess mm. because it can actually host nuclear uh, you know, mm -hmm. missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, and that also serve as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. I think uh, given the production, uh, research, development, production, maintenance, uh, the Australian government have ordered three uh, with probably uh, two extra mm -hmm. uh, nuclear power submarine. I think it put uh, the Australia as the seventh uh, country in the world, uh, seventh navy in the world that have nuclear power submarine. Mm -hmm. But also given, um, you know, the south, uh, the global south, mm -hmm. or, or the southern Pacific, a, a, a another high ground, 
of deterrence. Mm. Uh, it raised the profile of the Australian role in regional uh, security in the Indo-Pacific. Mm. So in the long run, I think um, this is a uh, uh, early, uh, uh, you know, plan uh, with a long-term effectiveness mm. uh, on on the Western democracies overall defense concept. Mm. Wanti, um, let's let's address uh, some of the things that Alexander just said there. Um, the there's the stealth stealth aspect of this. Um, it, it being quiet, it not needing to come up to the surface. Um, but interestingly, Richard Miles, the defense minister, Australian defense minister, has actually said that they want to be very, very transparent about their defense boost and spending, the AUKUS spending, unlike some other countries which have been uh, carrying out opaque militarization. Of course, uh, he's talking about China there. So as Alexander said, it seems that they do want this to be very much a deterrent a deterrence. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, deterrent is the name of the game for them. I think uh, that that bit is very clear, and that's why there will be uh, recent Australians' own public sphere discussion, for example, about how Australia won't really be getting its own uh, new AUKUS class submarine at least until 2040s. And if truly the situation in Taiwan Strait is so dire that a war could break out by 2027 or what have you, mm. then really w these are not going to be arriving in time to make a major difference. Mm. So that, that's why I think um, uh, my answer to that has always been that yes, but deterrent has two elements to it. There's mm. capability, mm. then there's intention or perceived mm. intention. So that's why through signing this August and set in motion a process that will likely take a generation, if not longer, to come to fruition. What they are trying to do really between US, UK and Australia is to signal this strong intent of cohesion, mm. of uh, alliance uh, mm. between these actors, which then will provide mm. other sort of autonomous political dynamic that will keep not only Australia more firmly in the US alliance camp, but also get UK to be even more deeply enmeshed in the Asia Pacific theater to a greater extent than he has done in a long, mm. long time. So mm. I think in that sense, so it's more political than, than it, military? It's a strategic mm. signal. Okay. That's uh, excellent. You know, mm. uh, and from day one when mm. it was announced. Mm. But, but I have to say, I, I think Wendy would agree with me that if the budget and uh, the building process is so transparent, mm -hmm. that might scare the taxpayer. Hello, I'm Ian Kavat of Taiwan Talks. We just discussed how the AUKUS subs will try to contain Chinese aggression. What we want to know from you is whether they will promote stabilization or destabilization. Let us know in the comments section. Also, if you like our shows, please hit subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel at Taiwan Talks 2022.